So, today on the channel, I'm joined by Professor Joshua Rasmussen. Joshua has uh, written a couple of books now. Um, his latest book, Who Are You Really?, is a deep dive into consciousness and the thoughts around how we can begin to explore and understand and think about the idea that the fundamental reality for everything is mind rather than mindlessness. It's a really interesting idea. I've seen a lot of philosophers of mind recently begin to move in this direction. Um, and I wanted Joshua to come on the channel. His book is fantastic. He sent me an early version just before uh, Christmas and um, it doesn't come out until March, which might actually be a similar time to when this video comes out, but we'll have to see. Um, and yeah, it's a fantastic book. I'd recommend anybody to pick it up and have a read and, and follow the journey that Joshua takes you on within this book. It's um it's really nice. It's, it's a step-by-step -step little bit uh, interactive where it gives you some sort of challenges or some suggested homework to go away and think about uh, to come back to carry on the journey. I did view it as, as a journey as I read it. Um, so yeah, it's well worth checking out. And this conversation hopefully is, is almost like a blurb, right? It's almost like an overview of the book. Uh, we don't hit everything at all, but we do hit some of the keynotes that I found to be really challenging and helpful and insightful as I read it. And everybody, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Joshua Rasmussen. Cheers. Hello and welcome to another episode. My name's Sam. Today I'm joined by Professor Joshua Rasmussen. Josh, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Sam. It's great to be with you. So um, we've been speaking for a little while. Um, you actually sent me a advanced reader copy of your new book, um, Who Are You Really?, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading over Christmas. Look at that. There it is in the flesh. There's evidence that it's in existence somewhere. It's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. And it comes out in March, right? Yeah, March 20. Yeah, that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to everybody, everybody being able to get into that. I know that you've been on a few podcasts kind of talking about some of the ideas. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of see yeah, how, how that unfolds in the sort of philosophical community. Um, before we dive into sort of some of the specific areas of that, and today I'm hoping just to kind of give you a heads up, just to give my audience a bit of an overview of your sort of research and thoughts mm -hmm. within this space. So we won't be diving too heavily into the philosophy, but more kind of looking at the sort of um, general overtones of the book, because I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, but before we get into that, would you mind just giving me and my audience um, just a bit of an understanding kind of about who you are, the sort mm -hmm. of work you do and the sort of beliefs that you, you hold, whether or not you're a theist or non-theist, like just a bit of overview would be really helpful. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, most fundamentally who I am is a person. So, you know, we have that in common. I, I like to kind of <laughs> start with that. Um, but I've been interested in my research in trying to understand kind of the nature of reality to the deepest level that I can. I'm always curious to see like, you know, what explains that, what explains that. And it really does kind of flow into every topic. Like if I'm thinking about in this book, uh, the nature of the mind or consciousness, I'm trying to understand what's sort of the deepest possible kind of explanation for how conscious beings could arise. Um, or if I'm thinking about even like relationships, now this doesn't show up in my, my uh, professional work, but I'm thinking about, okay, well, how do relationships work, what are some principles for understanding relationships? And so this is just a way of illustrating that I really am interested in trying to get to principles that can kind of characterize a deeper explanation of things. And I'm, I'm trying to understand truths that can be helpful for people. So it's kind of like this search for treasure and a search for truth and looking for that intersection between the two. Um, my, my working worldview, I mean, there's many parts of my worldview, but uh, I think you know a little bit about my story. Um, kind of earlier in my life, I was really wondering about kind of this big question about sort of is fundamental reality, like what is it? Uh, is it? Is it good? Is it personal? What are its basic attributes? And the, the working model that I have and, and the uh, model that I argue for in this book is that reality is, is deeply and fundamentally personal in some sense. And even understanding what that sense is, is something that I, I continue to grapple with to just kind of think, you know, what, well, what does that even mean exactly? Um, but I would say that, that is, has been kind of a theme in my work to sort of uncover principles and reasons to see that reality has these kind of foundational characteristics that can inspire a, um, a treasure in one site uh, as, as far as that's possible. 
I like that. I like that. And and just to kind of give us a bit of an overview, then a kind of um, a kind of your position of faith, I guess. Like, kind of how do you how do you classify yourself? Like, do you go around with that at the forefront of everything you do, or is it much more of a sort of who you are and you work from that place? Like, how do you kind of yeah? How do you view all that stuff? I do kind of feel of it more like it's kind of who I am. Like, there are certain core values, um, and I sort of work from those values. Some, sometimes people come up with certain labels for philosophers based on. Um, you know, certain beliefs like, you know, am I a Christian philosopher? And I don't know, I've, I've never really liked that label, to be honest, just because I feel like my work as a philosopher isn't care. I don't, I don't think of it like, like, imagine if I were a car mechanic, I don't think of myself being like a Christian car mechanic. It's like, maybe there are some core values of like loving the customers, valuing people, um, seeing the world as um, sort of friendly to our futures in the sense that there's a theistic foundation. Um, and so, you know, I could maybe call myself a Christian, but I wouldn't think of my work as philosophy, as a philosopher, sort of, I, I guess I like how you put it in terms of me kind of working out of certain core values, um, rather than thinking of myself sort of under the umbrella of a belief, if that makes sense. Because I feel like part of my work as a philosopher is to try to almost like challenge every belief and sort of seek the truth as far as I can. And if I kind of build into my core identity as a philosopher, a certain belief, then a worry that I kind of would have was be like, well, then can I actually question that very belief? That's part of my identity as a philosopher. But if part of my identity as a philosopher is more core values, of loving people, seeking the truth, pursuing wisdom, then I feel like, I don't know, I guess that just kind of resonates more with my style, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. I think, I mean, that's why people, you know, like, like Joe Smith, um, look so, look up to you, um, so highly, like you've, you seem to be somebody that, um, is able to look at things from both perspectives and actually give quite a grounded, realistic view of, um, or different worldviews within how you're approaching something. Uh, I, I, I mean, I found that in your book as well. Um, who are you really that you, you weren't shying away from looking at it through different lenses. You're very happy to kind of not just assume this one front and just push forward. You were happy to come through, through both, uh, both ways. But before we dive into some of these questions, then uh, kind of one of the things that kind of people throw around is this, is this kind of quote, uh, philosophy of mind. Now, some of my audience might not necessarily know what that means. So would you mind just giving us a very, very brief overview of what philosophy of mind is and kind of what the objectives are when somebody studies philosophy of mind? Yeah. So in the field of the philosophy of mind, the goal is to try to understand kind of the nature of things that we associate with the mind, but it's broader than just like thinking. Because I think usually we think of the mind as sort of the place of thinking, but the philosophers of mind, we're interested in um, elements of experience as well. Consciousness is part of the field of the philosophy of mind. And something that I've kind of noticed from interactions in social media and connecting with friends, um, not really working so much in the philosophy of mind, is that there can be certain impressions that the philosophers of mind are kind of using the tools of philosophy without an interest in the developments uh, in science. And one of the things that I really appreciate about um, the works of philosophers of mind is that what I see them doing is looking into the empirical sciences and then trying to apply reason and analysis to understand some different models of the nature of the mind, the nature of consciousness, the nature of who we are, that make sense of the latest developments empirically. And I think one of the challenges is that the empirical data gives us some data that doesn't necessarily tell us how to analyze that data. And the data then that needs to be analyzed, needs to be interpreted. And so this is kind of where some of my work comes in to sort of see if we can trace chains of reasoning from some common observations to some conclusions that might be sort of surprising. You might not realize that these chains of reasoning from these observations could result in these, these particular models. That's where I get very excited, actually, because uh, I think people often underestimate what they can sort of see through analysis. In fact, in the beginning of the book, you may have remembered this in the preface, I talk about this study that I did uh, where I asked people some questions about just their current beliefs about the mind and consciousness. And then in the study, what we do is uh, I worked with uh, another student on this and we collected data on people's beliefs. And what we found was that people normally have beliefs that through logic and reason entail conclusions that they didn't know about. They didn't know that those co uh, conclusions actually can be teased out of their existing beliefs. And so 
that's where I feel like there can be a lot of work by the philosophers of mind to kind of help us sort through different interpretations and models. So that's the, the goal is to understand the mind, consciousness, feelings, all those sorts of things that we associate with, with consciousness. Yeah, and it, it's trying to do it through um, a very um, structured way. You, you aren't just trying to jump from you know, point A to point C. You're happy to go through point B and just take it step by step by step and almost intuit um, what does this actually mean on, on reflection and kind of where does this lead us to? Um, in quite a lot of the sort of conversations you've had to date, um, one of the things you're obviously diving into is the sort of different philosophical worldviews um, about the fundamental reality of everything. Um, you kind of talk about the idea that the fundamental reality could be mindless, and that's kind of a very common view, especially within the atheistic circles. I know that I was kind of in that space for a very, very long time, but also the view that um, mind could be fundamental to mm -hmm. everything. Now, I've had conversations with you know, people like Philip Goff and kind of read quite broadly on this subject I'm, I'm not an expert though just to say that straight off the bat um, I know bits but not lots um, and I kind of get the feeling that slowly but surely even non-religious philosophers are starting to try and tackle or reckon, uh, wrestle with this idea that actually mind might be more fundamental than we first thought it it was you know just looking at someone like Annika Harris you know Sam Harris's wife Sam Harris very well known atheist Annika Harris also an atheist but she's very uh, interested in consciousness very interested in uh, panpsychism and talking to different experts around that sort of uh, kind of area and panpsychism being the sort of understanding that consciousness is fundamental to some degree um, I just find it really interesting that there seems to be a slow trend towards mind being fundamental, whereas before it was mindlessness being fundamental. And obviously, Joshua, you're very kind of aware of the sort of landscape, but it'd be really interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on kind of where things were, where they are, and where it looks like the conversation is slowly going. Yeah, well, it's a very complex conversation. And um, I see the complexity when I see the debates by people on different quarters of, of this conversation. And I think that every position on this landscape has some treasures of insight and we have a lot to learn together. This is kind of one of my themes, seeing how we can kind of pull the treasures out of all the different perspectives. I was even thinking again on the way up um, to this conversation, to this interview, I was just thinking again about some of the treasures in this view called uh, illusionism, uh, where elements of consciousness, certain elements of consciousness are thought not to be real at least not real as you might sort of think that they are from first person introspection, um, but are actually illusions in a, in a, in a certain way. And I was thinking about some of the value of that view um, and even kind of working out and drawing out some of the treasures in that view for helping us to understand the nature of perception. And I, and I focus on that view because that, that's a view that I think many people initially maybe wouldn't feel like that's the most intuitive view that you know our own consciousness or certain elements of consciousness like aren't even real. It's like if anything's real, it would be elements of consciousness. But then I, I've been seeing how there's great value in this uh, illusionist project. And I, I've been learning um, about how to kind of uncover some of those things. But as far as the kind of general trends, I think you are pointing to a trend that I, I've also seen as well, which is that many philosophers who are working into uh, working in this field, not coming in this field from a religious perspective or from a theistic perspective, often quite the opposite, um, sort of seeing theism and religion as kind of a, a part of a sort of a folk ontology or a folk sort of view of things that maybe science is overturned. But then many of these philosophers are finding through another chain of uh, analyses, thinking that mind is deeper in than they had realized. You know, you mentioned the Philip Goff and, and some of these panpsychists. Um, Galen Strawson is, is another one. But it's not just the, the panpsychists who think this um, Bernardo Kastrup is a, is a philosopher of mind who's followed the same path coming in as an atheist, naturalist. He's got, I think, two PhDs, one in philosophy, the other in computer science. And he's found a path through um, some empirical science together with logical analysis to a view, to a mind first view as well. In fact, I was actually wondering if I know people who are working in the field who are prominent, who have followed the path from initially thinking that uh, fundamental reality has mentality, and then through further investigation, coming to think that uh, fundamental reality doesn't have mentality. Those who are working, publishing in the philosophy of mind, and through the course of their career, moving towards more of a mind, mindless first view. And maybe there are such um, philosophers who have that journey, but 
my my very strong impression from going to the conferences and talking with philosophers and just reading a lot of the works is that the trend does go in the other direction that to their surprise uh, if they're going to update their view or change their view the change uh, is moving towards the mind first view of reality and again that this is including those who would call themselves uh, materialists physicalists um, atheists you know they're not looking for arguments for for god <laughs> Uh, in fact, many of them would continue to call themselves um, naturalists and atheists, even while they're saying that it looks like there's some kind of fundamental mentality. Uh, I mean, David Chalmers would be an example of this, who's thinking that in some sense, mind sort of seeps to the bottom. And this does, I think, open a, up a big question that, well, if mind seeps to the bottom is foundational to things, then kind of what does this tell us about the nature of reality? You know, what, what are the ramifications for some of these worldview questions? Um, and, and, but I just find it so fascinating that we can study this empirically, scientifically, analytically without coming into this field with a set of religious beliefs um, or theistic beliefs. In fact, it could be quite the opposite, and we can still end up finding a pathway to a mind-first vision of reality. And, and to be honest, if I could add one more thing here about the illusionists, um, those who would kind of eliminate a certain form of consciousness or like a, a sense of what it's like to be you um, thinking or feeling that kind of intrinsic quality from a first person perspective. Some of them would be kind of skeptical of some of the characterizations of that consciousness. And, um, and some of them have, have made the point that they actually agree with the mind first theorists, that they don't think that starting with mindless grains of reality could turn into this sort of first person subjective consciousness, um, at least characterized in a certain way. And so they actually agree with that. I mean, I, I like to kind of point to Alexander Rosenberg, not to point to a straw man uh, representing a view in the philosophy of mind. On the contrary, I really appreciate and love his work because I feel like he's uncovering what I would consider to be a insight that there's this great challenge in accounting for how thoughts can be about things if our fundamental ingredients are uh, basic mindless bits, units of reality uncoverable in the vocabulary of, of, of physics. And so he makes this argument that there wouldn't be thoughts as we understand them in our, in our minds if fundamental reality were fundamentally mindless and, and material in the way that he thinks it is. And so then he uses this as a motivation for thinking that there are no thoughts. And I really actually appreciate that because it does seem like there is kind of a, a, a widening pathway as people go deeper into this uh, between either uh, diminishing the mentality that exists uh, in, in, you know, your, your theory of mentality sort of de depletes and diminishes the elements of mind. No thoughts, no intrinsic uh, phenomenal consciousness, or mind seeps all the way to the bottom. Because, I mean, you might think the middle road would be, it's fundamentally mindless, but mindless stuff just turns into a conscious first-person beings, kind of strong emergentist uh, view or kind of emergence of mind. And we can explore that and talk about that. But my sense is that those who go deep into the field find more and more problems with that kind of emergent view. And they, they tend to kind of then split to thinking that, well, maybe mind is deeper in, or maybe mind isn't really what we thought it is. And, and maybe we sort of eliminate it in a certain respect. Um, and now I don't want to overstate this. There is still a very valuable research project about how if we start with mindless grains, we might be able to generate mind. Um, and we can talk about that and think about that. But from my observation, that view is kind of what leads to a certain host of problems. And even just minimally, just very easily, it's easy to kind of point to a certain kind of um, explain, explanation gap. It's not sort of clear how you can take some leaves or parts of leaves or rocks or parts of rocks or dust or carbon atoms and then roll them into subjective experiential feelings of love and a unity of, of a perspective. It's sort of not obvious how to do that. There are proposals, and we can think through those proposals. I could just say that in my own experience, as I've been analyzing these different proposals, it seems like the more that I analyze these, see, sometimes when I look closer at something, the problems I thought were there kind of vanish on scrutiny. In my case, just kind of my own experience looking at these problems, they've only magnified in my own mind. And I feel like this is actually a common path for many people working in the field. Problems don't kind of go away under, under scrutiny. If anything, they loom larger. I think that sort of illustrates a bit of why there is kind of a trend towards thinking either mind is fundamental or mind is not what we thought it was, or maybe it doesn't even exist. 
I want to invite you to join our community on Locals. There is a range of free and supporter only benefits to check out. On Locals, you can ask guest questions, access the reading plan to prepare for upcoming conversations, get early access to all the full length video and audio versions of each episode, and meet like minded followers of the show. The link is in the description, and I hope to see you there. Hmm. It's so interesting, isn't it? I know. So I've spoken to quite a few people, and um, I just think it's, it might be helpful for me just to kind of preface this so that the audience are aware. So we're kind of talking here about, um, I, I guess, the hard problem of consciousness, right? Kind of how it is that material beings uh, have an experience of what something is like. So it's something it's like something to be you, to drink a cup of coffee, to have that smell, to have that sort of qualia experience. It's, it's referred to quite often. Um, and, and the issue here we're saying, again, for the audience, is that um, the sort of step from a material thing to a um, conscious immaterial experience is... Um, is, is, you know, how do you get from one to the other? It's, it's, that is the hard problem of consciousness. Um, I, quite often when I'm talking to um, atheists or people who are um, philosophers of mind from a sort of more materialistic stance, um, I, as you already mentioned, they're kind of saying that there is this thing which is a, a human, which is a material object, and then through evolution we have kind of enabled this consciousness to emerge within our psyche and we can have these sort of qualia experiences or as you've already said the other way is to uh, kind of turn around and say well actually those things that we think we're having feelings and thoughts were actually not there they are illusion, uh, illusions essentially or we begin to try and eliminate certain things say well if if it is true that we are mindless and we've come from a mindless process adding mind to it isn't possible so therefore the end result must be that there is no mind within that sort of the consciousness there is just a, an inanimate sort of human brain that feels like it might be having these things but it isn't actually um i, I find very often that within the atheist circles it it's very easy just to say, well, of course it is emerging. Like consciousness must have emerged. And um, there's no other way to look at it. That must be how it happens. You look at a tree, a tree is potentially conscious in some very, very vague sense. Uh, you look at a bat as Thomas Nagel would, and you say, okay, a bat, there is something that it's like to be a bat. And then you look at a dog and there's something a little bit more there. And then you look at human and there's you know even more there. And it just seems to be this slow sort of trickling up or down of consciousness, depending on how, um, I guess highly evolved the the being is, um, and they'll point to that and say, "Well, that is that is proof that consciousness is emergent, and it must be that starting from mindless matter, we begin to get mindful things." How do you begin to kind of address that sort of very? I'm aware it's a very classic statement, but how do you begin to kind of address that and begin to to push into actually mind might be more fundamental than maybe we're we're realizing through our sort of classic evolutionary view of the world. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it opens up many different concepts that I find it helpful to just begin to sort of separate certain concepts and, and offer some clarifications. So first thing I, I just want to say right off the bat that in my own work, I actually offer a theory of emergence. So I, I do think there's a sense in which conscious states, like a state of a feeling or state of thinking does emerge, okay, it emerges. But then the deep question that I'm asking, and many are asking, is what does it emerge from? And, and so I think it's helpful to kind of make a distinction between the states of consciousness and then the subject or the being that's conscious. So, for example, I could have a state of thinking about you. And so that there's the consciousness of thinking about you. But then there's also the me, the subject of that conscious state. And so one observation that I would make is that states of consciousness might in some ways emerge in a context where there's already a subject, some kind of bearer of the conscious state, something that can have the conscious states. So now we can separate two questions. One question is, where do the conscious states emerge from? Okay, what's the material that can make mind or consciousness? The second question is, where does the subject or the substance or the being or however you wanna characterize it, that the thing that is conscious, where does it emerge from? Could it even emerge? And in thinking about both those questions, I think it's very helpful to make a distinction between materials that could produce consciousness, okay, materials that we can see can't produce consciousness, and then materials where we can't really see one way or the other. It's sort of agnostic about it. 
And so you can sort between these, these cases. And I think it is helpful to illustrate um, these cases with examples. So let's take, uh, let's start with materials that can't make consciousness, okay? Um, here, here would be an example I think would be pretty un uncontroversial among those in the audience. I mean, there might be some exceptions here, but the material of the number nine wouldn't be able to produce the feeling of love all on its own. Like nine isn't the right kind of material, okay, <laughs> to make the feeling. Um, so that would be just like an example where I think one can sort of see by insight into the nature of the number and the nature of the feeling that the feeling doesn't come from the number nine. Okay, so that would be a case where you could sort of see the material is wrong. Um, here's a case where I think maybe you could see that the material is the right kind of material to form a feeling. Um, if the material is a conscious being like you or me, then I think that we can actually witness through introspection the formations of thoughts and feelings that arise from the, that kind of a being. Okay. Now here's the material, and we could say more about, well, what is the nature of that being? And am I relocating the mystery of the consciousness to the mystery of the nature of the being? And in some ways I, I am. I mean, part of the project then is to understand, well, what kind of a being could produce thoughts and feelings? Um, but let me just set that aside and just illustrate this third idea that maybe there are some materials where it's sort of unclear whether it could produce consciousness or not. And let's say you're looking out at, at a beach and there's some sand blowing in the wind. And you're not quite sure if the sand on its own could start thinking or feeling because you're not really quite sure what kind of a material that sand is. Okay. Now, if you're not sure what it is, I want to be careful about making a kind of argument from ignorance that says, hey, you know what? I don't see how it could produce consciousness. Therefore, it couldn't produce consciousness. I don't want to make that kind of an inference. However, if there's a known material that can produce states of consciousness, then I want to try to build my theory in terms of what's known as far as I can, if that makes sense. And also through a little bit careful attention to what it means to be sand, I think it is possible. And I think this, this takes kind of concentration, analytical surgery, but I think it is possible. And I make, make an argument for this from different directions to see that cer at least certain aspects of sand couldn't be the whole story in explaining the emergence of first person feelings and thoughts. Um, and I, I think this is actually what Rosenberg is seeing insightfully. He's looking at certain um, aspects, spatial aspects, um, motions, um, aspects characterized by fundamental physics, where, where he's arguing that you can't just change elements of sand and just in virtue of those kind of third person spatial or functional, where the functions are in terms of the spatial aspects um, and, and, and basic physical aspects, would just on their own be able to start having those first person feelings. Okay. If the first person feelings have that kind of subjective quality that they may seem to have from your first person perspective, that's where I think you can get this kind of construction challenge. And, and I would make the argument that certain kinds of materials, certain kinds of explanations like that, it's not just mysterious. How could it be that, that through insight into the relevant natures? And again, I think this takes work. You have to concentrate onto the natures, focus on the shape of a triangle, focus on the feeling of, of love, can that shape just all on its own be the basis for the feeling of love? And what I, I would make the argument that there can be correlations between certain shapes and certain mental states. Like if you read an email, the email has certain shapes in the text, and then you could decode certain mental states that you know, you're interpreting the message behind the email. And that there can be law-like connections between certain shapes and certain mental states. But those law-like connections are already pointing to a deeper explanation. It's not the shapes on their own that's doing all the explanatory work. There's something deeper in. And so then this leads back to the question, well, what could link conscious states with other states? And here my general strategy is to appeal to materials um, as far as I can that are known to be able to produce consciousness and then remove from my theory materials that are known not to be able to produce consciousness, if that makes sense. And, and so that, that's a general strategy for thinking about this. And when we then come to emergent views, I want to distinguish between different kinds of emergent views. Emergent views that appeal to materials that either I think by certain reflection can be shown to not be able to produce the relevant data versus um, emergent views where you're actually appealing to materials that can produce the relevant data. So I do actually in the end argue for a kind of emergentism. Um, it's just, I need the right material, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it certainly does. Um, it certainly does. And I mean, in your book, you argue quite eloquently, sorry, eloquently, I can't even say the word eloquently, eloquently. Um, anyway, you argue in your book um, about introspection being uh, a, a fundamental kind of scientific tool to uh, actually be able to go away and do the research, to do the work oneself and actually begin to, and you mentioned it just then, you know, look at things and try and pick them apart. So from what I can tell, quite a few people in the space would uh, potentially say that introspection isn't a useful tool that it isn't something you can rely on it's uh, it's faulty it's flawed it's um potentially going to push you down roads that you'd rather go down rather than roads that are truthful josh what's your sort of kind of way of um, i guess kind of backing up the fact that introspection can actually be such a useful scientific tool for exploring kind of mind being fundamental and, and consciousness yeah so i make the argument that uh, well first i want to start with kind of what is introspection and when, one way of thinking about it is a kind of inner awareness of one, one's own contents of consciousness. So if you find yourself feeling happy, then it's through introspection that you can report that you're feeling happy. The idea here is you don't have to open up your eyes and then look at your face and see that you're smiling and then infer, oh, okay, I must be feeling the happiness. Um, you don't have to look at your brain, read some neuroscience and see, oh, you know what, the neuroscientists have shown that happiness is correlated with these structures of, of a brain, and I've seen that those structures are in place, so therefore I must be happy. Uh, you don't have to do that. I mean, you could do that. You, you could use your eyes, you could use science to get information about your emotions uh, through a kind of you know, external perspective. But the idea is that introspection is giving you an internal insight into your, to your emotions, perhaps more directly um, is one way of thinking about it. Although I want to be careful here because there are delicate theories in the philosophy of perception about whether you have direct or indirect conscious awareness of things even within. So, so there is a question about whether even introspection can give you direct conscious awareness of your own thoughts and feelings. But here we could even leave that open. One thing that I appreciate about um, Keith Frankish's work, uh, he, he's um, a philosopher of mind who motivates a kind of illusionist philosophy where mentality isn't sort of what it seems through the light of introspection. And one thing that I appreciate about his work is that he's pointed to a kind of uniformity uh, between the senses. So you have a visual sense that gives you data about shapes and colors, and then you have an introspective sense that can give you data about your emotions and your thoughts. And what Keith points out is that you could sort of treat those senses uniformly. So either both of them are giving you sort of direct conscious awareness of cer certain things, either shapes or colors or emotions or feelings, depending on the sense, or they're both giving you a kind of indirect awareness of certain things. So you might be indirectly aware of shapes and colors external to you in virtue of a more direct awareness of how the external world appears to you. And maybe in a similar way, you could have indirect awareness of your own thoughts and feelings by um, how those thoughts and feelings appear to you even within your own introspection. And here in, in the book, I actually, for the sake of modesty, want to leave these things open, at least at the outset. I do have a chapter on perception where I, I try to get a little bit more clarity on how um, your introspection could even give you a kind of direct access, a, sort of a direct window into your thoughts and feelings. But at the outset, I want to actually just kind of leave that open and even leave open the idea that introspection can be um, fallible in the way that your eyes can be fallible. So just as you can maybe misperceive something in the external world, you think you're seeing a chair, but it's not really there. You might be misperceiving something in the internal world of consciousness. And, and that's all fine. I'm, I'm leaving all of that open at the outset. My argument at the beginning is that you do have this tool of introspection and you can use it to collect some information. And one of my strategies in even motivating the utility of the tool is to talk about how I think that introspection is foundational even to do science itself. Because sometimes I think people get this feeling that there's a, a little bit of a competition between using the tools of empirical science versus this other tool of introspection. We're not sure if we can trust it. We don't know if it can give us reliable information. But I make the argument that even to do science using those empirical tools through seeing or using your instruments, you still need introspection for two reasons. You need introspection to know whether you've made an observation as a scientist. So if I'm 
looking at something with my eyes. Let's say I'm seeing a, a, a flower with my eyes. Okay, once I got the information about the flower with my eyes, there's a further question about now, after having made that observation, did I make an observation of the flower? So this is one of these questions that's so basic that it's, hard, it's easy to skate over it because it's like so basic. It takes a little bit of work to sort of appreciate it that there's an additional power. Aristotle asks this question, by what sense do you sense that you sense? By what sense do you sense that you see? And that's the question here is by what sense do you sense that you observe the flower? And I would argue that the very knowledge of your observing of the flower, that's not known through your eyeballs picking up shapes and colors. That's known through the introspection, the conscious awareness of the perception of the, of the seeing of shapes and colors. Okay, so, so I, I think introspection actually plays a role in even having knowledge of our observations. And, and by the way, I want to make sure this is clear. It's not that you have to have an awareness of your awareness in order to have an awareness. It's not as though you have to have an introspection of your introspection, of your observation, in order to just observe, quote, your observation, or to be aware of your observation. Um, so my thought is we can just sort of recognize ourselves being, um, having an experience of observing things. And then second, chains of reasoning that go from hypothesis to prediction. You know, part of science is about teasing out predictions from hypotheses and then testing those hypotheses based on observations. Well, that whole project presupposes that we're capable of tracing reasons or predictions that go from hypotheses to what they predict. And I, and, I, and I would argue that that awareness of the reasons in our own mind depends on introspection because introspection is the power to witness contents of consciousness in our own minds, including not just uh, that we made an observation, but also that there's a, a, an inference. And I really draw this out on my chapter on thoughts, that to understand even what a thought is and to understand the logical implications of a theory. So you think that this is true, but what follows from that? That's going to re use. That's going to make use of introspection, and so if that if all that's right, then there is a kind of circularity problem if you begin to argue from science, not that introspection can sometimes mislead you, but rather that introspection like always misleads you. The introspection reveals nothing about reality, because then you're sort of cutting yourself off from making the, to knowing whether you're making observations and following the chains of reasoning through the light of introspection. In other words. You're cutting off yourself from knowing the very uh, tools of science that are supposed to show that introspection can't reveal anything. And I think that's a, that's a deep problem. I call this the, dark, the darkness problem. It's the problem of turning off the light of all knowledge within your mind. You can't even know your reasoning. You can't even know that you're feeling unsure about whether introspection is, is reliable. You know, it's like if people are listening to this and you're feeling unsure of my presentation, well, then you admit that you have feelings. Okay, and uh, and and my my thought is that the the knowledge of your own feelings comes through introspection. So that that's a little bit of why I think introspection can be a useful tool. And there's a lot more to be said about that. But one thing that I invite the reader to do in the book is is to kind of conduct an, an experiment. So the experiment is, you know, consider my my motivation for introspection. Uh, whether you're fully persuaded or not, let's just see if introspection can give us information about the world, what information can it give us? And so the whole book is kind of an experiment in what introspection can reveal about uh, who you are, together with reasoning and um, empirical science. Yeah, I love it. I find it um, really interesting. It doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily fold into what you're saying precisely, but I also find it interesting that I might be um, thinking about something and, and, and mulling something over and then you know, I might be doing something else at the same time, like making a sandwich for my kids or whatever. Um, but my wife or my kids will pick up on the mood that I'm in um, without me actually saying anything. And then it takes them recognizing that and bringing it to me for me to then go away and actually realize that um, there was lots consciously going on that I wasn't actually consciously aware of. It was a subconscious thing that was happening at the same time. It's just, it, there's so many layers to this. I find it really interesting. Um, one of the um, one of the like classical things, I guess, within sort of uh, philosophy is uh, this idea of uh, kind of um, philosophical zombies, right? This idea that um, if we weren't conscious and we didn't um, have this qualia experience, um, there wouldn't be anything from us just looking at another person to say that they're also having uh, qualia experiences. It's almost like 
we, we, we have a key to understanding consciousness because we are conscious ourselves. But if we weren't for whatever reason, but something else was, we wouldn't necessarily know for certain that that thing was, um, was conscious or having qualia. Um, and I guess kind of that's, that's obviously a massive key to unlock this entire world for us. And it kind of obviously is why we have this hard problem of consciousness. It's, um, it's, it's a fantastic vehicle for us to drive down and, and, and utilize, but Part of me sometimes wonders, and this is maybe going a little bit off topic, but quite interesting, whether there are any other keys like that that we haven't got access to because of who we are. Uh, so there's almost things happening that, you know, in other animals or in ourselves or in the world or the fundamental spaces around us that we just don't quite get access to because we aren't that thing itself. Um, and have you thought much about that sort of space, Joshua? It'd be really interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a couple of things there. First, I just wanted to underscore something I really appreciate about what you said about these sort of unconscious uh, chains of reasoning or subconscious chains of reasoning. And I think that does open up even a way of motivating certain beliefs that might be under the radar, even of introspective awareness. And then even there, just to add to what you're saying there, because I think it's a very cool point and, and an important observation, that there could be subconscious change of reasoning. Um, that if, if there weren't at any time any conscious chains of reasoning, then we couldn't even have the concept of subconscious chains of reasoning because we would have never been conscious of any chains of reasoning at all. It's only because we at some times get introspective conscious awareness of reasoning that we can then recognize um, a distinction between conscious reasoning and unconscious reasoning, if that makes sense. And so I wanted just to highlight that because I think you're pointing to another sort of pathway of, of, of reasoning that can go under the light of introspection. I think that's an important pathway. And then to your second thought about the um, sort of the mysteries of consciousness and whether, I mean, maybe you can elaborate on this, but one part of what I hear you suggesting is that maybe part of the very challenge to understand and to explain consciousness and, and, and the very mystery of consciousness itself kind of puts us into a precarious position where any kind of solution to the hard problem that we come up with is a solution that's going to make use of our own consciousness, which is already perhaps mysterious. And so maybe we are in a position where almost like by the very nature of the mystery, uh, there's a limit to our possibility in principle to uncover the, the mystery. I, I'm not sure. I'm sort of thinking kind of out loud with you. I'm curious to hear more about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, we are, we are finited, boxed in limited. Um, we have the ability to, to go so far, but I think if, if consciousness or mind is fundamental, then, um, we might say that our consciousness emerges from this fundamental property and it has access to it because we're also conscious, but it is limited in, in how far down it can get essentially it's 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 almost like it can't quite um dive into or explore the space in a sort of meaningful way or oh, no, in, in a fully meaningful way like it's 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 almost impossible to get one's one's hand around i'm not i'm not, I'm kind of aware that the hard problem of consciousness has been framed outside of the classic scientific tooling. So it is, it's almost is impossible to kind of get your hands fully around it. But, but part of me wonders that even if we had the right tools and um, those tools need to be more than us because we're a limited subset of, of the fundamental reality of, of everything. I don't know. Does that, does that help anymore? Potentially not. No, I love that. Yeah, no, it just, it reminds me of that sort of classic paradox. It's like, we are in the state of limitation ourselves. And so given that state of limitation, how can we, in this state of being conscious beings, um, sort of resolve the sort of mysteries of consciousness? Unless we were, let's say, the fundamental universal mind outside the state of limitation, then we could sort of understand uh, consciousness and how it comes to be. But it's because of our position in, in the limited world that we are in a kind of precarious place. And, and I think that's a valuable point. I think that I would want to... Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is kind of part of my style in that I always get curious to see sort of how much I can see in principle. And so while I can recognize, you know, I'm, I'm limited um, until I can know for sure that I can't know something for sure, I want to go look and see how far I, I can go. And I would just say that, I mean, I've been kind of surprised in a way through my own research into this topic by some of the pathways that lead to what seemed to me to be greater insight. 
And so I do think it is possible to get insight. And I think part of that project really comes from the intention. Like, hey, I'm going to intend to look into this and see what I might be able to see. And in my experience, when I would look into something, and it's not just consciousness, really any topic, I just apply the lights of my own awareness on the topic. It seems like things start to get illuminated. Um, and I start to, to see more and more. And, and I feel like there is that possibility, even in this topic with respect to consciousness. I think it is possible to see these pathways um, from first the existence of our own minds, and then second, through the construction constraints, like not any material could produce us, to at least sort of narrowing the range of options about what kind of material could produce us. And I think that is a form of, uh, of progress. Mm. It's so fascinating. This, this entire subject is, um, um, yeah, it's so challenging, but so enjoyable. Odd, odd. It's great. Um, you've, you've obviously read, written, thought massively about this space, um, being a professor of philosophy as well. You've, you've kind of really dived into this. And I think one of the things that might be helpful for my audience to hear, and I mean, just bear in mind, most of my audience are atheist or agnostic, um, that doesn't mean they necessarily don't believe that mind is fundamental, but most of the atheist agnostics I've spoken to in my space seem to believe that kind of, you know, consciousness is emergent. I, it'd be really interesting to kind of hear your journey from where you originally started with this subject and kind of, you've obviously written this entire book to kind of explore it, but kind of um, maybe a few of the things that prompted you to change your mind to begin to think maybe mind is fundamental. Like what were the sort of, uh, I guess the, the first few things that knocked the dominoes over to kind of lead you to kind of where you are today writing this book? Yeah, I love this question because I've definitely been on a journey. Um, I've, I've had certain kind of impressions earlier on that have been overturned. Um, and even in writing the book, which is over the last few years, some of my thoughts have been filled in and some even overturned just through the process of kind of researching some of the latest developments in this field. Um, but let me just go back to when I was in college, and this is kind of when I start started really kept thinking about kind of what is my mind, how does it relate to computers. I was a software developer, and I remember being with my colleagues um, working on some computer project, and somehow on break we were talking about consciousness in the mind. And I have a memory of myself saying to one of my colleagues that I thought that the mind could be analyzed in terms of a sufficiently complex uh, brain. And they were debating on the other side saying that they thought maybe, well, love, there's something about love. They said love has a feeling to it that you can't really explain that just in terms of brain matter. And my response to them was to say that, well, maybe we don't know how to explain the feeling of love fully now. Um, but that's just because the explanation might be more complex than what we understand. And actually, we do seem to have some explanations of the feelings of love. Like we can talk about the parts of the brain that when those parts are activated and stimulated, that can generate certain feelings. You know, I mean, that this isn't, this isn't just entirely mis mysterious. Like we actually have a science of the brain and we actually know that certain feelings are affected by chemical reactions in your brain. So th this is, this is, you know, this is me making the argument for a kind of materialist um, first vision of, of consciousness. And, and by the way, even at that time, I had a framework that would allow for mind to be deeper in. Because even at that time, I was thinking that perhaps there's this sort of foundational mind, this supreme mind or um, original being that made the universe. But I wasn't really thinking that consciousness itself um, had to be explained by sort of other means um, at that time. I would say the next step in my journey was taking courses in the philosophy of mind when I got into graduate school. That's where these courses started to blow my own mind, um, just about the nature of consciousness. I took a course by a philosopher named Jaguan Kim, and he's the author of the book, Physicalism or Something Near Enough. And in his book, Physicalism or Something Near Enough, there's a reason why he has or something near enough, near enough in the title, because he makes an argument that there are certain aspects of consciousness certain qualitative aspects um, in the feeling of love that aren't themselves analyzable in terms of shapes or patterns of shapes or functions of patterns of shapes. And he, he, he works through this like meticulously in the book and he goes through different theories. And so he makes an argument that there's an element of consciousness 
that is left over and you can sort of witness it through that introspective light. You can sort of experience your love. And then this leads to the next question, which is, okay, well, if there's something about consciousness that's not the same thing as shapes or, or changes of shape or, or functions or other material aspects, then how are the qualitative aspects of consciousness related to the material aspects of the brain? Well, it's interesting because Jaguan Kim, he also has another argument uh, called the causal exclusion argument, where he makes the argument that you have to sort of be careful when you're thinking about how you can do things through your mind. Like, let's say you form a thought to, you know, move outside and then you go outside. Okay. It's like, well, how is the thought to move outside related to you moving outside? Or another example that philosophers of mine like to give is that you have an itchy feeling and the itchy feeling sort of motivates you to begin to scratch that itchy feeling. It's like, okay, but why? Why does that itchy feeling motivate any activity? And what Jaguan Kim argues is that you have to be careful in your analysis because if the fundamental ingredients are mindless uh, material things, and those things are the basic actors, then they, in a way, causally exclude the mental from producing effects of their own. And so this, this leads to a, a challenge and then a set of possible responses and, and a conversation that's kind of a long conversation. But I had no, I had no idea there even was this challenge. And Jaguan Kim is not coming at this as a theist. He's, he's not a theist. He's coming at this as a naturalist philosopher, uh, raising these challenges for how we can think about the qualitative aspect of, of feelings and consciousness, and then also how our feelings and, and, and intentions can make a difference to the physical world without being causally excluded by more fundamental mindless actors. And this is just the, the sort of the beginning. It, it opened up my mind to a whole set of different theories and options. Um, and then I began to contribute to the field, um, making some discoveries of my own, where I start to think about the nature of thoughts. And so these discoveries also have affected my own thinking about consciousness and the mind. And I would just say that there have just been these sort of episodes in my career where the theme has been to sort of see mentality as sort of deeper in. Like it, it couldn't really be explained by that. Yes, the science of the brain can help us to understand more and more of certain causal mechanisms between um, uh, brain activity and, and, and consciousness. But that still leaves open this deep, deep question about the nature of those connections. How, how is it that when the brain um, does certain things, that consciousness results? How exactly does that work? And once I, I think what helped me a lot was to see different models of how that could work and then look at pros and cons of the different models. Because then it's like, well, I want a model that sort of has the fewest problems and can explain the most. And in sort of my own search for a model of mind and brain, how they go together, that can have the fewest problems, doesn't have that causal exclusion problem, doesn't have this sort of binding problem of how you can take disparate things and put them together into a single conscious awareness. There's this kind of binding problem, doesn't have this kind of identity through time problem, how you can maintain being you from one day to the next in the midst of a, a sea of atoms um, changing uh, and being swapped out. And as I'm just myself thinking through the different models and thinking about how to best explain the data, I arrived at a model that I think is very scientifically, um, let me say, like fits with a lot of the latest science, even recent articles coming out in just the last few years about how there's correlations between not just what you do to the brain to cause mental states, but what you do in your mind to cause changes in brain states. There's a lot of interesting uh, research on sort of empirical uh, effects of thinking in certain ways and how those patterns of thought in your own mind can then actually change and even heal your brain in certain ways. Lot, lots of interesting studies on this. And then how do you explain all of this? You know, what's the best model for that? And so obviously there's a lot more I could go into on the different stages, but I would just say that um, I, I started with this kind of view that uh, we could explain the mind in terms of complex brain activity and then my own journey through the field has led me to think that uh, brain activity does connect with mental activity. There's a deep connection there. But I would argue that you also need the right kind of substance to underwrite that kind of connection. Um, and so I make the argument that you need a conscious substance, the kind of being that isn't just itself built up out of mindless grains of, of, of molecules, but itself has a kind of basic mentality. 
and then it's able to interact in the world through a brain. You know, much in the way that right now you and I are interacting through the device of a computer. And if the computer gets destroyed, it's going to destroy our own ability to consciously interact with each other in this context. You know, because sometimes people wonder, you know, well, what, why is it that when the brain sort of deteriorates, mental functioning is affected? And I think that has to do with these um, links between the mental functioning and um, our ability to operate in this world. Like the brain acts as a kind of control device, uh, which helps us to interact in, in the world in a similar way to the way in which this computer helps us to interact with each other. It's a kind of control device for sort of filtering certain kinds of conscious experiences in a way that's meaningful to this conversation. That, that's kind of the point of the, of the computer device to connect us in this way. So it doesn't mean that my consciousness is literally the same thing as pixels on the screen, but the pixels on the screen are mediating and affecting states of consciousness right now. If you're watching this, then I just wanted to let you know that you can access the same content in audio only form by subscribing via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible. In fact, you can search for the Socratic Sessions in your favorite podcast app. And whilst you're there, please leave a five-star review. It helps others to discover these conversations. All links are in the description. And thank you. One that's probably going to come from quite left field, just because I just thought of it, and it's an interesting one. Um, so do you, do you think then that consciousness begins begins as you know a child and ends at death like you know we're using the example of a computer being destroyed somebody passes away is that is that just the end of that or do you think actually that there's there's something else then that's kind of that that's tendrils go further to something else is that how you're kind of uh, people might be listening just thinking you're saying that there is something that's fundamental that reaches up and provides this ability for consciousness to to come about through specific materials as you're saying do those do those tendrils get cut? If that is what you're saying, I'm not saying it is, but you, you can clarify. If when those tendrils do those tendrils get cut when death occurs, and are they brought into a conscious being when it becomes uh, the right thing to have qualia? Like how do you how do you view that? That's quite an interesting one, I think. I think of it similar to how if the computer is all you know. Imagine all the computers die today, then the pixels that you're seeing on the screen here and the voice that you're hearing um, goes away. So you have no more access to me. So like, as far as you can tell, I've, I've died. Okay. I've been eliminated from reality. <laughs> uh, but I would say it's a, it's a inference to go from the pixels are gone to I'm gone. You know, may, maybe I'm, I'm still here. And I actually make an argument at the very end of the book. Um, and, and it takes, it takes going through the whole book for me to have the materials for making this argument. It's not sort of an easy argument, but if I could just sort of outline it briefly, it's, it's an argument for the indestructibility of you, a first person self, merely by destroying spatial objects that could come into your conscious awareness. Um, and, and the argument has to do with a sort of problem that's symmetrical to the, to the hard problem, although I actually turn the hard problem to what I call a construction problem. So I think of the hard problem as having to do with not seeing how to explain certain states of consciousness in terms of physics. So you're not really seeing how to explain it. But I sort of turn that into a kind of construction problem where, where I argue that by insight into the relevant qualities, certain constructions are just impossible. And then the symmetry of this is that certain destructions are also impossible. And a way of illustrating this is that um, if we can't construct you, Sam, just by constructing a sandcastle, okay, that won't construct you. Then we also couldn't destroy you by destroying that same sandcastle. Um, it's sort of a symmet symmetrical um, challenge. Um, the, the, the materials that wouldn't construct you all on their own wouldn't uh, destroy you sort of all on their own. Another example I, I like to give is would be in terms of contents of consciousness in your mind. So you might have thoughts in your mind that you organize into an argument. Now let's say somebody comes along and they destroy your argument. Okay. Or maybe there's some people listening to this and they're listening to my argument and maybe somebody's going to destroy my argument. And I'm going to say, Hey, thank you for liberating me from a bad argument. You haven't destroyed me because I'm not the argument. 
Okay, um, in the same way that destroying the sandcastle won't destroy you, destroying an argument that forms in my mind is not going to destroy me either. And and I would just generalize this that anything that's a mere content of consciousness, contents like um, images, thoughts, feelings, and e- even spatial structures in the imagery of a dream. Okay, those spatial structures in the imagery of a dream could be destroyed, but you're not destroyed. You could wake up or your dream changes because the contents of consciousness are not you. And this is a distinction I think gets lost in a lot of these discussions that I, I'm seeing is the distinction between the consciousness and the, the, the you, the being that has the consciousness. So even if the contents of the consciousness change forms or are completely destroyed, still you're there. Um, or at least minimally for sake of modesty, let me say, it would be an inference or a leap to go on to say that therefore you're gone. Just as if the computer gets destroyed, it'd be a leap to say therefore um, you and I have been destroyed, even though people can't maybe see us through, through the computer. So, and, and then I'll make this argument from um, this sort of destruction challenge that I actually do think that if you are a first person self that can have thoughts and feelings, and that's not a trivial if, you know, I take some time to argue for this. But if you are that kind of being, then you're not going to be destroyed merely by destroying um, arguments or contents of your mind or even spatial contents of reality. Um, because I make the argument that spatial contents of reality aren't sufficient to make you who you are. So what makes you who you are doesn't depend on spatial contents of reality. And I just honestly, I mean, this convinces me that if my body is destroyed. It is like destroying my arguments. Um, it doesn't thereby destroy me. So I, I do believe that um, we continue. Um, that, that's my current working model. I could be wrong. I'm open to new evidence. I've been wrong many times before. Um, but this just seems to make the most sense of the data that I've considered so far. Super interesting. It's, um, yes, yeah, so much to think about. Um, before I dive into that, there is a question from uh, Patreon. Um, we've kind of already covered this, but I think it would be good just to kind of go into it a little bit more. So um, um, so if mine is fundamental, why don't we see it more pervasively within this yeah. world? Um, there seems to be much more kind of mindlessness stuff and much less mindful stuff. Um, so kind of why don't we see more mindful stuff? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's actually interesting because it reminds me of a parallel question I've wondered about on another side of things, where if mind emerges from mindless matter, then why doesn't mind, like, like how can we rule out that there isn't more mind emerging? Like, you know, m- maybe up here in my forehead, there's some matter that causes there to be some sad beings, okay? But I would have no access to those sad beings because they can't, like, communicate their sadness. Um, I mean, I guess what what I'm highlighting the value of the question, because I've sort of wondered about this just in general, like no matter what the ingredients are, whether they're mindless or they're mental, um, sort of what are the demarcations of mind? You know, why isn't there more mind or how do we know there's not more mind? And this is something I've I've honestly just been thinking about and pondering, and which is another reason that I appreciate the question, because I haven't really come to a clear answer to the question. But one thought that I've had is that perhaps if there's a kind of organization in the world and there are constraints on what could make consciousness, okay? So not just anything can make consciousness. Then that might predict that consciousness shows up in certain kind of special states. Um, Maybe there are advanced sort of organizational states like computers or brains that facilitate very interesting kinds of conscious interaction. And maybe it takes a certain kind of complexity of a brain or complexity of a computer in order to facilitate a certain interesting and complex social interaction, which might do some work to explain why consciousness sort of shows up in more um, complex systems like brains or even, and I mentioned computers because this computer that I'm looking at now is facilitating an interesting kind of complex conversation with you. And if the computer were simpler in certain ways, we just couldn't have this kind of interesting complex interaction. So I've wondered if if that might play a role into this uh, as well, that the very interestingness of certain kinds of complex conscious interplays depend on complex devices like brains and and computers. And that might explain then why consciousness doesn't sort of 
manifest itself um, in the in the rocks, you know. But but again, it's sort of tricky because if there were consciousness in the rocks, it couldn't like tell us that it's there, you know. In fact, I make this argument in the book that if you think there isn't consciousness in the rocks, probably uh, it's because you sort of implicitly have a kind of insight that is, takes a certain kind of material to make consciousness. Uh, rock formations isn't the wrong material. And I think about this when sand sort of blows in the wind. Like, could sand just turn into a conscious being? I, I just, I, I think there's a problem there. And if sand can't do it, I, I think kind of by relevant differences, I don't think just organizing the sand into the, the, the shape of a brain would by itself be enough. I think you need the presence of a conscious substance working through the technology of a brain to facilitate the kinds of experiences through that technology. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of an answer, but it's something, honestly, I'm still thinking about, which is why I really appreciate the question. Yeah, yeah, it's good. So obviously, Who Are You Really comes out in March, as we've already said. Um, what are your hopes for this book? Like, kind of, it's, it's written, I would mm -hmm. say, to, you know, a, a, a wide audience. I could engage with it, I'm sure. You know, experts can read it as well as lay people. So kind of, what, what are your hopes with um, kind of releasing this book to the wider audience? Kind of, what are your sort of ambitions and dreams for it? I wanted to empower the reader to explore the cave of consciousness by their own lights. I feel like right now there's so many voices talking about the nature of consciousness saying, no, that theory is not true. My theory is true. And I think a lot of people sort of feel disempowered to even investigate this sort of thing. And this is why one of the things I do right in the introductory chapter is I talk about tools for entering the cave of consciousness. And I'm often inviting the reader to just sort of check things by their own lights. Use these tools, use your tools, use your lights. And I'm kind of modeling my journey for the reader, but I'm inviting the reader to sort of see things for themselves. And, and that's kind of my big goal for the book is to empower the reader. I think that that is an advantage of using tools that you can test things for yourself, where you can actually sort of check, am I thinking? <laughs> am I feeling? Um, you can inspect your thought. Do my thoughts have aboutness? Do, is there, are there logical links like and and, or, and or in my thoughts? You can sort of see those things. And so the, the information is not hidden behind some experiments in a laboratory that you don't have access to that laboratory. Now, you may have access to the reports about those experiments, and those will be relevant. So bring all the reports. Let's look at those together. But ultimately, I do want the readers to feel empowered. I mean, all the way to the end, I arrive at this um, theory, this, this model that I think can account for the data that I consider. And I invite the reader to consider that. But, but at the very end, I also have this note where I say to the reader, you know, whether you follow kind of my path or your own path, I hope that all the things in this book can help you appreciate the significance of explaining your existence. Like, like it, your existence is so profound that reality should include a being like you is so profound. And I think sometimes we mistake the familiar. It's familiar that I exist. We mistake the familiar for the insignificant. And, and a big part of the project is kind of inviting you to sort of see yourself from any different angles so you can appreciate how incredible it is that you're real, that you're actually part of reality. And, and then to sort of face the challenge of understanding, well, what does this imply about the kind of reality this is, that it should include a being like me? Um, and if I could just add this, I try my best to be inclusive in my approach. So even as I give my theory, I, I arrive at a kind of mind first theory of reality. There's a kind of fundamental mentality. I still kind of leave open how we might characterize it in terms of a range of theories. You know, we talked about panpsychism, idealism, forms of, of theism, cosmopsychism. There's all sorts of different theories that are, I think, different angles and ways of unpacking this sort of core idea of mind is, is primary, mind is, is fundamental. Um, and, and even if a reader gets through my whole book and is just not convinced that mind seeps to the bottom, at least I hope they'll come away appreciating the significance of their own existence. However you came to exist, there's something very amazing. I have a whole chapter even just on your value. How could, how could you be the kind of being uh, that could even have value? What does it mean to have value? So, Oh, yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I feel like if, if readers can come away feeling empowered, then I'll feel like I've accomplished my goal. Yeah, well said. Um, listener, watcher, there's a link for the book in the description. Um, Josh, we've obviously had like a whistle-stop tour of 
certain elements of your book and you know it's been quite a broad ranging conversation um is there anything that we've missed or neglected that you would like to kind of dive into just before we wrap up like anything that i should have asked or anything that you want to kind of highlight or go back into i really appreciate that and um you know i I think we really did cover a lot of the kind of big topics that i care about and just to kind of throw in just a little like a little bit of candy i have this chapter on thoughts and i'm pretty excited about this chapter because it builds on some original discoveries um, that I've published in three different articles on building thoughts. And there's this big question, like how do you build a thought? And part of the project in that chapter is to begin first by analyzing and observing some aspects of your own thoughts right within your mind. Thoughts have aboutness to them. Thoughts have structure. A lot of people don't really kind of think about the structure of a thought. There's a structure of thinking that two plus two equals four which is different than the structure of thinking that uh, four plus two equals two. Same at conceptual elements, different order, different structure. You know, what explains the structure? And so I actually work out in that chapter um, a theorem from some first principles that I argue you can check these first principles through introspection. And that if introspection is revealing reality, it's going to reveal some basic principles from which I deduce a theorem. And the theorem says... Uh, in colloquial terms, what it says is that you, it's impossible to make thoughts out of mindless matter alone. Impossible. Um, and so that opens up the, the question, well, then how do you make thoughts? Um, and there's different options. Well, maybe the mindless matter produces thoughts, but not in a deterministic way or produces them in sort of a mysterious um, way that we don't understand. Or maybe what we have is some kind of mentality that produces thoughts. But the theorem, I think, constrains our options. It constrains our, our, our um, you know, what we can say about how to make thoughts. And so I want to just kind of throw that candy in there because I'm excited about that. Um, and I think that it, it kind of builds on some of my own work and, and highlights an aspect of us that is also so familiar, you know, that we think that's so familiar. But just thinking about these familiar elements in our own mind, I think, can reveal something, not just about the nature of our minds, but also even the, the origin of our minds, what kind of construction materials could make us, could make thinking beings. And, um, and so that, that's just a fun chapter. So I wanted to point to that. Amazing. And before I let you go, Josh, where would you point people to if they wanted to uh, find you, find your work, reach out, like what would be the sites or the place you'd want them to go and check out? I would say just my website, joshualrasmussen.com. You can get a lot of free resources and articles there. And you can access some of my work on, on YouTube as well. I've got a channel called Worldview Design that um, I've been developing. So, yeah, thank you. Amazing, Josh. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for yeah, letting me read your book and for coming on the show, mate. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Likewise. Appreciate it. Thanks for checking out this episode. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And make sure you check us out over on Locals. Cheers.